right now it's my pleasure to introduce Mariah Harris. Uh, she's been a master gardener for eight years and she has lots of certifications. You'll see at the bottom of the title page. She is a VNLA horticulturalist, which means Virginia Nursery and Landscape Association certified horticulturist. And she's an ISA certified arborist. And that is the International Society of Arboriculture. She is the owner of Metro Garden Works and spends quite a bit of her time pruning, looking at trees, and maintaining sustainable landscapes in Northern Virginia. Mariah, welcome. We're all looking forward to this talk quite a bit. Thank you so much, Holly. Yes, she's right. There are lots of acronyms, and all that means. I was excited to learn more, so when came up, I certification because I wanted to learn. Welcome, everybody. Let's get started. So the question is, do I really have to prune? And actually, you don't have to. So we could just end this presentation now and head off to an early lunch, but the reality is we're living in human-made, man-made landscapes where people are looking for something in between this lovely poodle, which would be one extreme of pruning, to the other extreme, which is when nothing is done and plants are basically consuming our lives. But what I'd like to get to is something in the middle. So that's our goal today. So as Colleen mentioned, I do spend a lot of time talking to clients. There are many reasons why people want to prune. These are probably the top ones. Almost always the plants are way bigger than when people have them installed. So when you buy them at your local nursery, they're one foot by two feet. Even reading the label, sometimes they're much bigger than you expect. So that's often a reason people want to prune. They're just bigger. Sometimes they're now smashed together or they're encroaching on something. They're blocking your window, your door, etc. The third reason I have there, I don't hear it as often. I wish I did, I'll be honest, in the sense that pruning is such an important part of keeping plants healthy. Uh, usually people don't see the health issues, they'll see the aesthetics or the clearance issues, but the plant health is not as common. But I think an important point to make here is that good pruning is a really important step in managing pests. Good pruning means you have an improved environmental condition around the plant. It might not be intuitive right now, but as we go through, we'll explain how that happens. But when you have improved environmental conditions, you have improved plant health. If you've participated in any of the master gardener other programs, you might have heard the term IPM. That means integrated pest management. And that's a whole presentation in itself. But basically, it starts with selecting the right plant for the right place. So, you know, making sure that the plant you have will fit the conditions where it's going to be living. That can vary from sunlight to water to soil. And then a middle step that people often miss is pruning. So before you get to the point of applying pesticides, there can be pruning measures taken to improve the health of the plant and improve the airflow and light conditions around the plant before you apply pesticides. It's also often true that many pesticides, especially for things that treat insects like scale, like dormant oils, require that the oil actually contacts the insect. So if you haven't pruned before, you have an application of something like that, it's less likely to be effective because it's not actually getting where it needs to. So the title of the presentation is Woody Plant. That includes shrubs and trees. Trees are a very special case um, as an and as an arborist. I'm going to talk a little bit about pruning trees and what good pruning cuts look like, but I'm also going to refer you to some resources because trees are so important that they're a place where you don't want bad pruning. Especially large trees in our landscape, check with a certified arborist. This is not the same as a tree company. Tree companies may or may not have a certified arborist. You can check someone's credentials by going to the ISA's website treesaregood.org. If you're in Maryland or another state, there could be a local state organization as well that certifies arborists. You can check in your local state. This is the International Society of Arboriculture site, and you can put in a name or you can put in a credential number and see if somebody's an arborist there. Ideally, if you can get an independent arborist, you're having someone assess the pruning needs and the health of your tree independent of whether the tree is worked on. So that's unfortunately a little bit of a conflict of interest sometimes with tree companies because they're not going to get paid unless you agree to have something pruned out of the tree or the tree taken down. So if you can, especially with large trees, have an independent arborist take a look and give you some honest, less biased, I should say, feedback possible before doing anything with your trees. 
There were a bunch of W's in the title, so we're going to start with this one. What are you pruning? This can be a difficult step for some people, especially if you are new to the plant world. Identifying your plant is really important. I think Colleen mentioned the Master Gardener Help Desk that's open right now. That's a great resource for getting the right ID for your plant. Pictures, samples can be helpful. You can also use a lot of apps. Some are better than others, I'll be honest, but it might give you a starting point and then you can pursue some other resources. I would get, you know, maybe a double confirmation if you're not sure. Another thing to do is just observe your plant. Take a look at when it blooms, dormant time. That's harder with evergreens, but generally dormant time is when a plant loses its leaves. Bloom time, you know, even if you're not taking pictures of your plants, maybe you've got a picture of something outside your house and you can see behind it if the plant's blooming. Another part of the observation process is to look at last year's growth. That's the, the image I have here on the right. There's a line right here. Hopefully you can see my pointer. These are called bud scale scars. And this growth from beyond that is how much the plant has grown since last year. This line here was this line last year. So that just gives you an idea of how much your plant is growing. Because if you're working with decreasing the size of the plant, that could tell you a little bit about how much it's growing. If it grows consistently year over year, that's its standard growth. If this is not as long as other years, then maybe the plant is under a little stress and it's not growing as vigorously because of water or just age. But that's helpful to sort of understand how your plant is doing. The next one, understanding how your plant wants to grow. If you can see the plant in the wild or like in a park, those are good places to try to get a sense of how the plant might want to grow. You do have to be a little bit concerned about sun versus shade because plants do grow very differently in those two conditions if they can tolerate both. Be careful about looking for what that laurel is supposed to look like in, a, let's say, a parking lot or around your HOA. Unfortunately, a lot of those locations have very, very heavy pruning, which can include shearing or just less appropriate pruning techniques. And so this plant looks like there isn't necessarily the model you should go for. And we talked about right plant, right place. So consider the species that you're planting and the location where you want to plant it or where it's already growing. Is it going to fit there? Does it fit there? And if not, think about, do I need to prune this every year a lot to keep it in that location? And before you spend your time or financial resources on pruning it, it there could be times when Picking a different plant, as hard as a decision as that can be sometimes in that location, just so you're not making more work for yourself. But if the plant will fit that location or if it'll tolerate the pruning, you know, we'll, we'll talk about how you can manage some of those things. So another question people have is when should you prune? In our area, our area meaning Northern Virginia, mid-February into July is safe. If you're further north, you're probably going to have to push that February date a little further out because it stays cold longer. If you're further south, you may be able to go wider on both sides. What you're looking for is avoiding pruning the plant wherein it's a significant period of transition. So what I mean by that is if you can prune in mid-February in Northern Virginia, usually the plants haven't yet broken dormancy or are just beginning to break dormancy. So buds are beginning to open for the year. Ideally, our worst freezes have passed by that time. If you're in an area that may still have really deep freezes into March, you would want to wait because sometimes pruning a lot will expose plant tissues that didn't previously have such exposure to cold and you can actually get cold dieback or freezing damage. I'd say the thing that people do on the other end, and it varies where this information came from, but pruning in the fall is really not a great plan. And the primary reason why, and we're going to talk about what a plant does when you prune it, but when you prune a plant, you're expecting it to grow after you prune it. And so what can happen is that the plant will shoot off a lot of new growth right before we have freezing temperatures. And usually those new tissues don't have time to go through a process called hardening off, which means that they begin to get used to cold. And it's a whole process for a plant to, to harden off for winter. So when you prune later into the fall, you're exposing the plant to a lot of damage because of that. It's also a big transition time for plants because they're going into dormancy. They're dropping leaves and any sort of metabolic thing that it needs to do, whether it's respond to new growth, deal with a huge wounding, uh, you know, through a big pruning cut is a big thing that the plant has to deal with while it's trying to do these other big things. So 
if you can avoid that, you're going to help the plant balance its resources a little better. And the other thing people are not always aware of is, you know, they always often see the winter dormant pruning because that's what a lot of the information says online or in, in guidebooks, et cetera. Dormant slash spring pruning have two different effects. So if you're pruning in the spring, what you are doing is a more rejuvenative pruning. When you prune in the summer, this could be called a more reductive or reducing pruning. I'm going to pull a little math out here, so stay with me for a second. The reason this occurs is in spring, the plant has previously, from the winter, stored all of its resources into its root system. So if you have a plant that has 10 stems coming out, some kind of shrub, when it's going to push out new growth in the spring, what it's expecting is to push out growth on 10 stems. So if the amount of energy in the roots can put on, let's say, one foot of growth onto each of those stems, that's 10 feet of growth across the whole plant. Now, in the spring, if you cut five of those, and this plant has the same energy reserve in the roots that it did before when it had 10 stems, that same amount of energy has to come out of five stems. So we're still looking at that 10 feet of growth we talked about with the 10 stems, but now out of five. So we're going to say you've halved the plant, which means you've doubled the growth on the five. So the five stems are each going to grow two feet instead of the one foot that each of the other stems grew. That's a really rough example, but the idea is that that same amount of stored energy has to come out somewhere in the plant. So that's often why when you prune something in the spring, you go, wow, it grew so much because it has to still get that energy out somewhere. In the summer, you're dealing with a different situation where the plant has already put on all that new growth that it did in the spring. And now what you're doing is actually reducing the photosynthetic capacity. You're reducing the plant's ability to generate energy. And so when you do that, the plant now has to adapt to that, but it's not going to necessarily shoot out a lot of new growth. It will some, but it's not going to do as much as it does in the spring. So that's something to consider depending on what your pruning goal is. So we'll talk about that. All of you should have been sent a resource. It's called the VCE Shrub Pruning Calendar. And that's a really good starting point for somebody who's, you know, wondering how to prune some stuff in your landscape. You'll notice that it's organized by plant, which is why you have to know what's your plant. So if you have questions, again, the, the Master Gardener Help Desk is a great place to try to get identification. But once you have that, that's a good place to start. So we talked about summer pruning being a reductive pruning mechanism. If you're going to prune a lot out of a plant, even if you plan to reduce the size and do a summer pruning, if you're not sure, especially in our area, July can be pretty hot. We could be getting into the, the 90s depending on the year and, and it could be dry. So if you're not sure about how much you're going to affect the plant, do it on the earlier side, maybe somewhere in between that, like June or late May, to give the plant more time to recover. And you're also going to see in the pruning calendar and anything you read online that if you're dealing with a plant where there's a bloom or a fruit display that's an important part of the aesthetic, prune it after that period. So that's solely aesthetic. You can prune an azalea before it flowers. You can prune a, a fringe tree or a winterberry before it has, the winterberry is usually a fruit display. There's nothing that says you can't prune at that time, but it's really more about getting to enjoy the, the display. What's important is not to prune in the middle of flowering. If it's fading out, that's not the end of the world, but the plant is using a lot of resources to flower. It doesn't have a lot of photosynthetic capacity at that point to recover. It depends on the plant, but you're trying to avoid those, as I mentioned, those big transition periods, and I would call flowering one of those periods also. But before or after is aesthetic, depending on what you would like out of your season that year. All right, tools. How do you prepare? This is a really important part that I would say is also sometimes a little overlooked. When I just did this for myself, I yanked out of my tools whatever I had handy, and that's what I used to cut. It's important that you do maintain your tools because it's better for plant health. In terms of safety, safety glasses, although they seem like overkill, I'm inside plants a lot, leaning in to cut things, and pieces of plants come out of nowhere and, and can get you in the eye pretty quickly. Also, you could be pruning something and things go flying. So if you can, if you've got something around that'll work, as an arborist, I technically have to follow the ANSI 787.1 standard, and the equipment that I get has to have that standard. The reason that standard exists is that it forces the glasses to, for example, not break into sharp 
bits and cut you if they do shatter. It's a, there are various things that they're looking for, the breakability there, um, how much impact they can withstand. So if you can get something that has that standard, that's probably more rigorously tested, but regardless, wear something over your eyes. Disinfecting tools is also something that's important, especially as we get hotter and more stressful plant conditions. There are many diseases that can be moved between plants. So what you'd like to do is disinfect your tools. I use a spray, a disinfectant spray, not this one, but this is just a generic picture of one. You'll find some things that say to use rubbing alcohol. That doesn't work as well for me because I'm usually moving and I don't have time to like wipe down alcohol. But if it's just at home and you have a good place for those things, use what works for you. Just make sure it's effective for disinfecting. Sharpening tools is also a difficult thing for people in home landscapes sometimes. Try to sharpen your tools semi-regularly once a year if you can't do it more than that. Bypass pruners are this type of pruner right here. What that means is this blade is going to bypass the other half of this tool. I don't know what you'd call that part of it, but it's not actually a blade. But this blade bypasses this surface. This other tool is called an anvil pruner. And I'm going to back that up so you can see it. What an anvil pruner does is it has a blade that contacts the opposing surface. That is not the kind of tool you want to use. And what that tends to do is crush the plant as opposed to slice through cleanly. So that's why you're generally going for bypass pruners wherever possible. If you can have replacement ones with replaceable parts, this particular pruner, I know you can replace this blade, you can replace any of these parts. The same goes for the saws. I use various saws. Most of mine are arborist saws in a home landscape. That's for you to decide what your budget can handle. But I think if you can find one that folds, it's pretty safe for a home environment. And if you can also find one with a replaceable blade where you can get those easily, that's an easier way to keep your tools up to speed. These saws are also impossible to sharpen. Somebody might be able to sharpen them. I haven't found somebody yet. Replacing them is also easy. The reason we're going for all of this is because well-made, clean, nice cuts equal better feeling of wounds. And that's what you're going for to keep your plants healthy. If you have plants that are damaged because of your pruning cuts, that's a place where disease can enter. And I forgot to mention this. If you happen to be left-handed, which I happen to be, find left-handed tools where possible. I do know they make them for bypass pruners. Pretty much everything else probably right-handed, but the bypass pruner is the most important. So now we're on to planning. This is really important because before you even begin pruning, it's really important that you understand why you're pruning. So again, these are some of the most common reasons that I hear. It's too tall, it's blocking my view out my window, out to the lake, out to whatever. I need it out of a walkway. Some people can't even use their walkway anymore because the plant is now completely covering that area. A lot of dead stems are things that don't look aesthetically good and you want to remove it. This last one is something I hear. I haven't pruned in years. I'm pretty sure a neighbor told me, my grandma told me I should probably prune it. And I'm going to tell you that I don't think that that's a valid reason. I'd like you to have a more concrete objective. Because if you don't have an end point for your pruning, you can often do much more damage than not. And there's nothing that says you can't have multiple objectives, such as there are a lot of dead stems and I need it out of the walkway. So it's just having an actual end point is what you're going for. If you're going to make drastic you know, it depends on the plant, but if you're going to make drastic changes to the plant, it's 15 feet tall and you want it to be five feet tall, you might need to do it over time. So it's going to be a pretty big shock to the plant potentially to do it over one year unless you really know this plant and you really know it'll be fine doing that. So it's okay to say, okay, I'm going to make some cuts this year and actually have a strategy and take the outside canes or limbs and work it out over time. You're going to have much better results if you can maintain the natural form of the plant. That's why we talked about knowing what it's supposed to look like. If you're not sure, you know, like I said, try to find examples. When you begin to take the plant out of the form that it wants to be in, the growth just looks strange. We'll show you some examples of how to keep it looking natural while still getting the things done that you need to. So these are the really rough overviews of how. Remove dead and diseased wood, we talked about that. If you have diseased wood, don't just cut the part that's diseased. You want to cut several inches beyond the visible disease. 
says here to cut to a lateral branch or bud, I'll talk about the, the specific place to make cuts, but cut beyond the disease. Removing crossing stems is also something you often see in a lot of pruning tutorials and things. It's really difficult to remove all the crossing stems in some plants. So if you've got an Ikea, if you've got a viburnum, a witch hazel, if you try to get all the crossing stems, you're going to end up with no plant left. So if you have a lot and it's a big issue, prioritize and take the worst ones this year Take the next one other years. What is the worst one? The worst one is the one that's causing the most damage to other stems. So it's like rubbing so much that it's taking tissue off that stem. Another one that would be bad if I had a choice between two stems would be one that crosses over multiple stems and kind of weaves itself through the plant. If I take that one out, I've gotten rid of multiple crosses with just one cut. So prioritize what you really need to do, but don't feel like you have to get every single one because it could be really difficult depending on the species. We're going to talk about this concept of what an issue stem might be, but when we're setting our objectives, if it's too tall, maybe those are the ones I need to take care of first. If it's had some really difficult pruning, some of the strangest looking ones, the ones that are coming out my walkway the most, any of those would be issue stems depending, again, on what your objective is. 30% is, is a general guideline that is, I think, fine for homeowners. If you shoot for that, you'll be okay. What you want to do is only take what you need to achieve the goal we talked about. So if you're dealing with things that are in the way and you only have to prune 10 stems or 10 bots to get that, that's okay. You don't have to keep going until you get to the 30%. No matter how much you're pruning, you want to try to make as few cuts as possible because we talked about those good cuts being places where the plants can seal up. Well, every place you make a cut is an entry point for decay, whether it's fungal organisms, bacteria, those are places where disease can enter. So if you can minimize the number of those, you're going to be better off. And you should always, always, always step back. Step back occasionally, you know, walk back out to the front, the sidewalk, take a look and remember what you're trying to do. Sometimes you get tied up on things like deadwood or something that you found inside the plant that you get sidetracked by, but you want to make sure to step back periodically. And if you veered off course, reroute and try to get back to your objective and make sure that what you're going for is still what you were trying to achieve. All right, so this is something that people don't think about, I think, when they prune, is what is going to happen to the plant. People that work with plants a lot, fruit tree people, bonsai people, people that manipulate plants a lot to do what they want to do know that they're doing this on purpose. They're manipulating a plant to achieve a purpose. And home pruning can be the same thing. What's going to happen to a plant when you actually prune it? So the response that you're going to get depends on the actual plant. So I'm going to make a couple distinctions here. So you may read in uh, descriptions of plants something that says a plant is alternate or opposite or world. And that just means that these growing points, what are showing up on this uh, image as buds, those, if we're in the case of an alternate plant, they alternate up the stem. Sometimes they'll alternate front to back. This is a side to side, but they could be front to back or they could even go all the way around, but they're going to alternate as they go up. This one is an opposite plant, and that means that the nodes, the growing points, oppose each other. Again, they could oppose each other and turn on 90 degrees as they go up the stem, but if you look at one location on the stem, the two growing points will be opposite each other. And you might wonder why this matters. Well, you can see that the way they grow is very different. Wherever you cut a plant, whenever you cut a plant, you can expect, if this is upright, the buds behind the cut to grow. So in this image, these two buds are growing. It's not uncommon to have one, two, three, four buds growing. If it were sideways and this were a branch, it would be the same behavior. It's just horizontal instead of vertical. This has a more staggered growth pattern. I mean, it looks like a wishbone. It's very wishbone, but if you have multiple things, it's a much more crowded growth pattern. So that's why you would want to know what type of plant you have. So let's look at a couple examples of what this looks like. So this is the species that I've cut here on the left. You can see my pruning cut right here. Uh, there was a lot of cicada damage on the tip of this, so I, I had to prune some of that out. This is a service berry, which is an alternate species. I've listed some other alternate species under here. Most species are alternate. So when that happens, you can see the growth that came out from both of those. 
kind of matches the picture, maybe reverse because they're opposing kind of mirrors. This picture in the middle is a holly, which some people think are opposite because if you look, the leaves are actually very close. They don't alternate very much, but they do. And you can see it in the growth pattern across the tip. The growth is not all at the same height. It's a little bit staggered. I am going to say that this plant was sheared. And that is not a practice I would recommend unless you're ready to do a lot of shearing and correct a lot of health issues because shearing forces the plant to grow only where you cut it. It doesn't grow anywhere else. So by shearing 500 stems right here, you have just asked the plant to grow 500 stems right here. So if you imagine that this pine tree instead was your lovely bay window that looks out onto the mountains and you just keep cutting the plant right here, you just keep asking the plant to grow right there. And so it, it's contrary to your purpose. So make sure that the pruning technique you're applying is, is going to achieve that purpose. So let's look at an opposite plant. A very common species people have in their landscape here that's opposite would be uh, viburnum. Dogwoods are also common around here. Maples are trees, but they're also opposite. This is a perennial. This is a bone set plant, but it had the same arrangement and I thought it was a good example. So you can see the pruning cut here and you have the same growth, that wishbone. This is a branch of a possum haw viburnum. Um, same. It's horizontal, but the growth is the same, that wishbone pattern. I often say that um, <laughs> viburnums are very difficult to prune because of this reason. They double your problem very quickly and they can get really messy. So it's good to think about this when you're pruning and we'll talk about that. The other question I get a lot is, wow, where do I cut? You know, people have their pruners out and they're not sure where to cut. So I'm going to use the, the picture to kind of show where some good cuts are. The angle of your cut is important in that it's not two angles. So if you imagine a line right here, I don't want to go below that. I want to keep my angle just above this bud, which is what I'm expecting to grow. You can go straight also, as long as you're not getting so close that you're damaging the bud. What you're trying to avoid is this kind of cut on the right where you leave a really big stub, a stub meaning a big gap between your node, your growing point, and the next node. So this, all this wood right here is going to die and you'll just have this little stub. The reason that's an issue is the plant needs a nicer cut in order to be able to seal out any incoming decay or disease. And when you leave a stub, it doesn't allow for that to happen. If you also angle a cut through the bud, that's going to kill this bud. And now the bud further back is going to grow and you're going to end up with a stub. This is also another kind of cut that could happen, which is you angle it too steeply. And when you cut all the way below the bud on this side, even though it's on the opposite side, you can damage the tissue enough that this bud will die. The angled versus straight cut, the theory behind some of that is that water can blow off the cut. Some more of the theory has to do with the way the plants will seal. I make all of my cuts angled, but if it's too difficult, just make a straight cut until you're more comfortable. That, that'll work too. It doesn't always have to be angled. I thought this was a good stopping point to take a breath. Any questions so far? And the only question, can you dip tools in a Clorox solution as well? Does that work? It should work. With both Clorox and sometimes with alcohol, the corrosive quality on your tools is the thing I'd have the most hesitation with. So if it requires the Clorox to dry on the tool, then it needs to be dilute enough that it can be effective without corroding your tools. I use a disinfectant spray because it's highly alcohol-based and it also evaporates really quickly. So that would be my concern about Clorox would be the corrosiveness. You had mentioned dipping in alcohol was another method. Someone asked, do you need to rub the alcohol on the tool or can you just dip it? I've mostly sprayed mine. I've made like an alcohol bottle spray before. I would imagine you should be able to wipe it too. Whatever is convenient. Wiping tools, if you have sharp blades, is sometimes an injury waiting to happen. So figure out which one works for what you need. But again, I'm usually on the go. So if it's something I can spray on and it can evaporate up on its own while I'm doing other things, especially at the end of season cleaning, wiping down shouldn't be an issue as long as you're not hurting yourself. There was a question about someone started to prune and then the weather snapped and got bad again. I think this was specifically for a quince. They started mm -hmm. pruning it. It got really cold and it had already bloomed and then 
What should they do? At that point, just leave it alone and let the plant sort of recover and do what it's going to do. A quince I'd be less concerned about in terms of freeze damage, for example. The reason I'm less concerned about a quince is they're usually deciduous, which means all the stems have been exposed to cold. So they should have each gone into whatever dormancy they were going to go into. Sometimes if you have a very sheltered plant like a boxwood, which kind of has a shell on the outside, when you begin opening up holes in it, some stems now are exposed to cold that really weren't before. With the quince, I would probably just leave it if there's any winter dieback. That's not necessarily because of your pruning. Once it starts leafing out, you can prune the dead out. I wouldn't do anything corrective except to wait to see if any damage occurred over winter and then correct it. You kind of start a cycle of keep cutting and it's not solving it. Someone referenced your picture of the sheared hedge that had all this new growth and uh, wanted to know if you want to limit the height of a shrub like that, but don't want to encourage that growth is your only option is to prune a little bit down low. How should you approach that bush? Very astute, yes. The technique I want to show you should address height, but with that pruning into the inside of the plant. I think that we could go on now. Okay. All right. So that that was an excellent segue into what I am calling a practical pruning technique. Thinning is something I use pretty much on every plant that I prune. It's a very useful technique for homeowners. As referenced in the question about the holly, what is thinning? It's removing stems, but removing them often down to the interior of the plant. Based on what we just talked about, why would you want to reduce to the interior of the plant? Well, if you don't want it to grow at the tip, you want to cut it to a point where the growth achieves your goal, in this case, the height. So by pruning into the interior, you're going to generate growth inside rather than at the tip. So the cuts can be partway down the stem. This picture has different places where cuts could be made. So they can be partway down the stem. You want to prune to another branch or above a bud, which we we were talking about before. Or you can prune all the way to the ground. In this picture here, this little stem at the bottom, it's not very strong. It might be too weak. And you can go ahead and just prune that to the ground and let the plant start over with a new branch. What you do when you thin, your ultimate goal besides fixing the height and other issues is you want to remove some density from the plant. That increases light flow, light penetration to the interior to grow those stems that you cut lower. And it also increases airflow. So it achieves the goal of reducing your height, et cetera, while doing those other things. And it pretty much works for multi-trunk with lots of branches, trunks usually. So let's look at an example of why you might use thinning. The plants I have here, I've identified it. It's an Ilex glabra inkberry. It's a, a native cultivar. This one is probably shamrock, uh, just based on how it looks and, and where it was located. This is an alternate species. We already figured that out when we talked before. And the problem that we're trying to address is that it's beginning to block the windows. So I'm going to set my objective, which is to reduce the height and thin the plant to reduce the density because I want to improve light penetration because I would rather see more growth in here rather than right here. So what I want you to just notice here is it's difficult to see the siding of the house through the shrub. And there are big thick sections such as this kind of blob right here. So let's see what that looks like as we continue. So first, we talked about setting the objective. Our main objective is to reduce the height. So the stems I'm going to work with first are the tallest. And then I also have the secondary goal of improving the light penetration. So we're going to either cut stems to the ground or to a growing point, And we'll see what that looks like. So if you take a look, I'm sort of outlining these five Stems. I cut a lot more than that, but we're going to just simplify it with the five. These are the five stems I have here on the left to show what those look like sort of outside. I'm going to remove those, again, cutting either to the ground or to an appropriate growing point. Now, this is what I have remaining. My expectation in a season is that the growth is going to look like this. And I didn't show it here, but there would also probably be some new stems coming from the ground because that's what this plant does. It will send up new stems from the ground and renew itself that way. So those are sort of my tallest ones, but I'm gonna go through and find each of those is causing a problem. I'm also gonna go through and find any locations where there's a lot of density. So these are the stems that I cut out. You can see I have some really long ones. I have shorter ones. It varies, it depends on what I was trying to do. But 
because this plant grew, part of it has to do with the way this plant normally grows, but it also has these very long stems with no leaves along them or no stems. And that's because there's no light in the middle of the plant. So there's no point for the plant to have leaves until it gets to the top. Because if a location on a plant is not going to be able to provide energy or photosynthesize, it drops the leaves. So that's why you have plants sometimes only with growth at the tips, because the plant has to get to sunlight and then it can put out the leaves. So those are just an example to see what size stems am I doing. What you'll notice that I'm not doing is taking the little tips, because that's basically the same effect as shearing, only with hand pruners. So what I'm doing is thinning, and I'm taking larger pieces to open up bigger gaps. So what you'll see here now is that the plant is now informally, I'm calling it informally because I don't care if the top is super straight. I probably would have in another environment taken this even lower, but I was working with the plant and there was not a lot of internal growth. So that's about as far as I felt like I could take it without having it look just like thick. And because of the decreased density, you can kind of see little glimpses through to the siding more than you did before. And some of them are just dark spots that are glimpses to the interior of the plant. You'd like to go for glimpses as opposed to big holes, but sometimes mistakes happen and it'll it'll correct itself, but that's what you're going for. So I'll show them side by side. You can see that the one on the right is less dense and I've gone for the goal of reducing my height. And that's all I want. I don't want a particular shape. I wanna keep the shape the same as the original plant it wants to be. And that should reduce how much I have to do every year because the plant is going to grow from the interior and it's growing in its natural shape. This is another example of the same species as a different property, but you can see these have been pruned that way every year for several years. They have a lot of lower growth. If any of you have this particular plant, one of the issues it has is it has a lot of what they call legs where you can see the stems. That's because of just the growth going at the tips over and over. So you have to prune. Location could also be an issue, but that's an example. So this is just a different location, same technique. Let's pause there. The holly question, I think, approaches that, but does that technique make sense? Does that, do you want me to cover, recover any portion of it? I'm going to show you a couple other plants using the same technique. How often can you prune boxwood? Some boxwood I prune every year. Depends on the type of boxwood, depends on how much damage some cultivars like Korean boxwoods, you almost have to prune every year uh, because of how vigorously they grow. English boxwood grow very slowly. Once every two to three years, it depends on how much you're pruning each time. So it depends a little bit. But if you wanted to just start something that hasn't been pruned for a while, I would do smaller doses of pruning and do it annually for a boxwood until they, they have a lot of inner growth and they look nice. And then you can space it out to like every two years or so. Would that advice hold true if you're trying to attain a certain shape? Again, it depends on the boxwood. Boxwood are also an opposite species, but they just don't grow as crazily as some of the other opposite species. If you're trying to keep shape of something longer, these holes that I mentioned, these little openings, you're going to need more because you want more of the growth to be inside, not outside changing that shape that you just spent all that time creating. So when you topiary, for example, like the the poodle at the beginning wasn't a topiary, but when you create a very strong defined shape, you also have to open up holes to make sure that the growth is on the inside as well as the outside because you can't avoid it from the, the shaping. Are there any shrubs that you can prune more than once in a year? You can prune all of them once a year. So the question about the viburnum, you, know, you might do an initial pruning in the spring and then you're going to see it, the way it responds to the growth. And then you see, you know what, I need to take a little bit more of each of these and you could do that in the summer. I prune my stuff multiple times, my, my personal stuff. Um, you know, if it needs it throughout the year, you can, you can always uh, tweak it a little more. Just again, keep the goal in mind so you're not just cutting the plant for the sake of cutting it. There was also a question interesting. If you have to use a pest treatment, would you prune first and then treat? It depends on the pest treatment, but if it's a systemic and you're applying it to the root and it's going to be uptaken by the plant, then you wouldn't necessarily have to. But if you're using a dormant oil, uh, those, again, they require coating the insect. So if the insect lives on the stem or lives on the underside of the leaves, it's very difficult to get to those if you haven't pruned because you have kind of a shell. So it depends. Systemics, not necessarily. I think I would advocate for pruning regardless, even if you use the systemic, because 
your disease problem may be persistent because you haven't affected the environmental conditions. Light can't get in, which means birds can't get in, which means uh, insects can't get in to eat or work on killing or, or predating on those. Um, scale is eaten by plenty of things. It's just it's often deep on the inside of a plant where something can't get to it. So I'm just going to show some thinning of some other species. So these are very common ones in the landscape. Same process I just described, but with different species in mind. So this front one is very common in landscapes. It's the auto lupin laurel. Uh, shorter laurel grows sideways, kind of angular. This one at the back is some kind of mahonia, uh, probably leather leaf. The one here is also a common one in landscape, hydrangea, uh, quercifolia oak leaf. So I've used the same technique on all three of these. And what I wanted to point out in this picture, I have not made them look the same. They've kept their actual shape. So the auto lucid laurel is lower, it's thinner. The objective here was a little bit was height, but a lot of it you can't see because I didn't take a picture of the top of the plant. It had a severe scale problem. So I've tried to manage that by pruning and opening it up, I'm trying to think of what, which scale it was. Prunicola scale. It looks like white, almost baby powder sprinkled on the stem. So that was the purpose of this pruning. My goal between these two was if you can bring any texture back to the landscape and manage your height that way, that's what I did. So this one is taller, this one is lower. This one had really overgrown the space, so I've thinned it. You can't see the brick through it that well because these are so big leaf. This is also an opposite species. And this one, again, to thin it out for health, there were a lot of disease stems in there that were removed. And there was a little bit of trying to not block the window as much, but we didn't want to expose that all the way. So same technique, three different plants after bloom time. This azalea in the front is going to get the same technique of taking stems further down, keeping the shape of the azalea, which is this nice, lovely, sort of like upside down umbrella crawling up the stems. We'll use the same technique on all of these. This is a boxwood. I would use the same technique. It was too cold when I did this to do the boxwood, but that'll get the same. Same theory. For opposite leaf plants, what you might have to do is cut more stems to the ground than with an alternate plant because every cut you make along here is going to double the growth. So it doesn't have to be for every single cut you make, but for cuts you make here, you want to take thin stems to the ground. Which stems you take to the ground depends a little bit on what your goal is. If you're trying to manage the size of the plant, the stems you're taking to the ground, we're going to talk about in a sort of a cane pruning thing. Those are going to be probably the oldest, tallest stems. If you're trying to manage size, those might be some of the side ones. And the other ones that you can take also usually are the ones that are very, very thin, like let's say less than a pencil, because those have often grown while the plant is very full and they haven't gotten really good strength to them. And even as they grow bigger, they're going to stay a little wimpier than the others. So it's better to go ahead and take those out and let the plant generate new, stronger stems because it has more light now reaching the bottom. That's why a lot of those stems end up weak, because there's not enough light on the interior of the plant. So for that question, for this shape, you might prune it. And then, yeah, you might come back in June or July because you see that each of those doubles that grew, you don't necessarily want both of those and one of them can be pruned back. There's nothing to say that you have to keep making this cut over and over. If you come back and the plant looks like this, you can take just one side. You want to avoid doing it on every single one because it can change the overall shape of the plant and then you might have more pruning down the road. There's no reason you can't come back through and take one stem that's not the one where you want it. You also want to vary the height and location of your cut for both species, but it's even more important for this plant because if I make all of my cuts into about this level, that means I'm going to have this explosion of growth right here. Whereas if I put some here and some here, it's going to balance the overall plant. There's a lot of aesthetics and looking at the plant and looking at how the shape looks when you're done. So think about that as you're going. And you'll learn in the process where you'll see where things grow and what you need to change next time. So this is an example of a viburnum. Again, exact same technique. This one is way more than 30%. <laughs> I realize that in the picture. This is the viburnum plicatum. So this was reduced in size. You can see the size of one of the stems that came out. It was huge. This hadn't been pruned in probably, oh, easily six years. And this plant is too vigorous for this location. And the owner knows that, <laughs> but they would prefer to keep it. So that's what we're going with for now. And they can decide to replace it. You know, when you have two plants side by side, I'll also go back to this picture. 
there's nothing to say you have to prune only this plant. You should prune each plant into its appropriate space rather than just whack the living daylights out of one. That did happen here because this is a smaller shrub and a tree just had a few branches lifted off of this, but obviously you can see the difference. You can actually see windows. That's an example of the same technique that we just used, but a totally different plant shape. We're still keeping the original shape of the plant, which is this, again, kind of lilting stem. The, um, the Ilex glabra we did in the, the main example is similar to this, but you can also have what would be cane type plants. So again, it's thinning still, but we're working with individual canes. So species that use this would be Orsithia, Spirea, Deutzia, the Nine Bark, Itea virginica, Virginia Sweet Spire. Those are a couple natives. So if you see a description of a plant and it says it suckers, then it's the candidate for this type of thinning. And often cane type plants have this very arcing habit. And so what happens if people just go in and tip it off, is it really changes the shape. And that's when you see it looking like an upright thing with growth coming out rather than the original graceful arcing shape that's here. If your goal is height or just generally maintaining the size of the plant, you're going to take the tallest cane and you're going to take them pretty much to the ground. If you're renewing it over time, keeping it within its size, you're going to do the oldest stem. If you're managing it for size, you can do the tallest stem. And again, you're looking at about 30%. So let's say there are 30 canes in here. Maybe you go through and you look to take out 10 of them. You might take out more because if you take out all the dead and diseased ones, maybe, you know, maybe that's 15. You want space at this space because the space left here is where the new canes get to grow in. And if this is so jammed up that new canes, there's no space for them, well, then they just won't grow. So I'm always looking at the base of these plants. Sometimes you can only cut to about here where this dotted line is because it's so crowded in there. So every year when I'm looking at those plants, I kind of move my hand and wiggle any of the old dead stems that were left from past pruning sessions. And usually after a year or two, those will loosen up and come out because they've kind of died back. So you're cutting the issues, but keeping, again, the overall shape. So if you cut several from this side, spend some time on the right side and take some of those out. But taking them to ground level is important to maintain the shape. You could come back through, and this example has two that are coming off. You can come back and take one of those. But try not to just make a generic cut right in the middle because these both will grow and then you have a, a different shape, one going straight up, one going out to the side. So this is cane pruning, but it's still a thinning technique. We're just applying it to a different plant form. I mentioned nine bark as being an example of a cane plant. This is a native. Some of the common problems are, you know, it's the wrong cultivar or the straight species and it's too big. Again, the base can get very crowded. So you want to deal with those stems that are dying back and go ahead and get those out to make space. When stems have to reach for a lot of light, they get scraggly. It's a lot of stick and just a little bit of leaf. So again, what you want to do is remove the issue stems by cutting all the way in if possible. In this case, if we said this was a walkway and these are starting to get too far, those are the ones you would manage. Nine bark, based on you know what I've normally seen, anywhere you make a cut in the middle, they will shoot up new growth and it can really change the shape. So I would avoid mid-stem cuts unless you have another branch coming off of it that will still keep the shape. And you definitely want to walk around the plant and if you're managing the overall shape from side to side, then you want to take a few from one side and take a few from the other side. And you want to also do the thinning that we talked about to open up light because if you look at the bottom of this, it's black. There's no light getting through there, which means no new canes are growing. So Create some opportunities for light to get in there, and that will help keep the plant growing with new canes, which you need for future years. Itea is a common one also in this area because of all the native landscapes. They can get really crowded, so you might go through and take the oldest stems, and so that's some of these. Or if you're correcting something, I've seen these sheared, which looks really rough. You might go through and take out those really knobbly stems that have been sheared too many times to help bring it back into shape and it might take a little time. But by doing that, you're going to rejuvenate and get new stems growing on the inside and it'll keep the shape a little bit longer. This is another one that grows funny. It can make a strange shape if you cut part way. I included these because these are very special cases, but people might have these plants. This is a specialty form red bud, a weeping one of Ruby Falls is one cultivar. 
The problem with any weeping plant, including red bud or cherry, is that because of this heavy overgrowth, everything underneath dies. And so the only thing that happened in this pruning is to take out all, well, not the only, but primarily, was that dead wood was taken out. So this is how much dead wood was in this plant because the outside layer was so dense with leaves that nothing inside got light. So the plant just decided to get rid of those branches. This is an example where getting rid of crossing stems cannot be your goal. If you get rid of crossing stems, you will uh, remove everything. So this is a case where crossing is okay, and maybe over time, some things that are uh, a problem will be taken out, but you've got to manage it more aesthetically. But opening up the light to enter the interior is still the same goal, because otherwise there's a lot of dieback. This is another special case. Again, some people might have this. This is kind of a funny one. This isn't thinning, but, um, and these pictures aren't great. I apologize, but what happens with a lot of hybrid plants, sometimes they're grafted. Japanese maples, weeping cherries, and also this case, a lot of the witch hazels. There is an upper part of the plant, the plant that you normally see, it's the phenotype with what the flowers are. Then there's a rootstock, which is the same plant. Usually it's the native species or something that is more tolerant of the soil conditions. So in this case, this is a maybe an Arnold's Promise, I'm not sure. And the rootstock is the regular Hamamelis virginiana. This is a, a red of the same witch hazel. What can happen on these is you'll get these strange growths from the bottom that look very different than the flowers at the top, the reason you bought the plant. And in those cases, it's sprouting from what's called the rootstock, and it's going to have a very different look than the rest of the plant. You don't want to prune those. You want to get rid of them altogether. So you're going to take those all the way back to the root. Sometimes this happens because the soil is piled too high and it's over the grass line. Um, so in addition to pruning those, you may want to move some of the soil down the stem a little because maybe that's why it's suckering. If you let those go, that will often take over the plant and you don't have your as much of the, the yellow flowers or the red flowers, whatever variety you purchase. So those are grafted species are a case where you want to really watch where the growth is coming from and prune it back if it's not from the upper half of the plant. I'll pause there again, and then we'll close out with a little discussion of trees, and then if there are specific questions, I can hang on to those. If they have diseased plants, how do you decide whether to treat or to prune out the disease? I mean, it depends on the plant, but you know, if more than 25 to 30 percent is dead, obviously that might not recover, so you may have to decide something else. I would always recommend, as soon as you start seeing some kind of dieback, to go ahead and prune it back. One is it can affect the advancement of the disease. Some diseases will enter in the softest tip tissues and move back to the vascular system. So by pruning it out, you slow or stop the advancement of the disease. It's also because as people, you know, we look at something and if it stays in our landscape, we go, yeah, I, I think that's what it looked like last year. Um, I don't think it's dying back more, <laughs> but it could well be. And we're just so used to looking at it, we don't know. So by pruning out the dead, you have like a baseline again where you have no dead. And so if next season you see the dead again, you can go, hmm, something else might be going on. So I would always advocate for at least initially pruning some dead out. Obviously, you'll have to decide sometimes taking the dead out can really maim the plant. And if you're not willing to let it grow back or it's not growing back fast enough in a show landscape, you're not going to wait for it. You're just going to replace the plant. I would always prune out if possible, but it might get to the point where you have to replace it. There was a question about how much you should prune, and they used specifically a red osier dogwood before you transplanted it. Oh, that's interesting. Well, red osier dogwood, I think that's uh, Cornicericea, I think. I'll have to look that one up and see. Two things. It used to be a thing where people would say oh, cut back before transplanting. That's not necessarily the thinking anymore. What you could do would be in the fall to go ahead and what they call root prune which means to go around the plant and dig a, a circle around the root ball. The cutting we do to the branches that forces them to grow, well, the same effect occurs on the root. So you would cut a circle, make the circle a size that you can lift to transplant because if you can't lift it, it doesn't help. But if you look up root pruning, you'll see examples of cutting a circle around the plant. I would do that like in, let's say, September or so, and then move it in February. And when you move it, that ring will have a new root tip there. Red osier dogwood is also one that grows from cutting, so you could just restart a new plant. 
pretty easily by cutting sticks and putting them in potting soil. That's for a propagation class, but red osier is, is something that should be easy enough to move that I don't know that I would worry too much about pruning it back. But prune it back so you can grab it and transplant it. If it's so big, you can't transplant it. You might have to cut it into chunks or do some pruning to be able to grab it. Is beautyberry in the category of cane pruning? Kind of depends on which one. Um, the native beautyberry, which is uh, Calicarpa americana, has more of an upright, I would say less canes. It will cane, but it's not quite as caning as any of the Asian species. So that's the tiny purple ones. The Asian ones, I would say, are a cane plant to some degree, but the standard pruning for that is actually to just cut all of the stems back. You could do the cane, but usually people just feel like it keeps the shape better to cut them all to about, you know, 6 to 12 inches. For Scythia, sometimes it's managed that way, too. There are two questions that are kind of related. Someone has a massive juniper that is now 15 feet wide and wants to narrow it to about eight feet wide. And another person asked about pruning cedars that are along a driveway. If you have a juniper that's 15 feet high and you want to get it to five. No, it's um, 15 feet wide and they want to get it to eight oh, feet got it. wide. Okay. okay, sorry. Okay, got it. Sorry, I'm switching my terms. Okay, so two things. One is that just the term juniper or cedar there are, there are a bunch of things in those categories. And so it's good to find out like Eastern red cedar, for example, is actually a juniper, but we call it Eastern red cedar. The name is Junipers virginiana. So knowing which one specifically it is will be helpful. For both of those plants, though, they're evergreens. What you'd like to do is cut into the plant only to where you see live growth. This is an important technique for conifers specifically, needle bearing plants cut only in as far as you see new growth. So don't cut into just a bare stem. And the reason is not all stems will put on new growth. So you have to see the growth actually already occurring. With both of those, you said there was a cedar that was too big? It was near a driveway. So I assume it might be impinging on the driveway. Okay. I'd have to see a picture of the cedar to understand that better. But still, what you're going to have to do with both of those is potentially dose it out over time. So that means cut in only as far in as you see new growth to reduce the size. And then wait until it puts on that new growth and then do it again. Because you're going to have to bring it in incrementally. If you go just from 15 feet to 8 feet or from the driveway to off the driveway, you may cut into wood that will not regrow. So you want to do it incrementally for both of those. How long should you wait to prune after planting something? For shrubs, usually you have a rule of thumb I would use is maybe a year. But the thing you want to check after you plant is grab the stems of the plant and see if you can rock it side by side because it may have been planted badly. And if it was planted badly, the roots aren't taking in the soil. I've lifted up azaleas that had been there for two years that are still not. When you plant, you need to cut the roots so that it will grow into the native soil. So check to see if the plant has fully rooted. And I would say if it's fully rooted and is putting on new growth, then you should be okay. You can always write a plant and cut out anything that got broken or something that's already dead or diseased. That's okay. But for like shaping, it's usually a year to two years, depending on how well the plant has been planted and is, is taking to that location. How hard can you prune a burning bush and not <laughs> kill it? You can prune a burning bush pretty hard. If it's been sheared over and over, which is very common for burning bushes because they just are such vigorous growers, you may want to go ahead and cut it really far down to restart the shape because otherwise the shape is going to be this very witch broomy effect at the tip. But burning bushes are examples of ones that you can cut pretty hard and they will grow back much nicer than if you try to fix the shape. Forsythia is another example of that. Azaleas are another example. The Japanese holly. If any of those have been pruned so badly in the past that their shape is really far from the original shape, it's often easier to prune them to the ground during dormancy. When I say to the ground, I mean like with stems maybe uh, four to six inches tall. You don't have to like get all the way to ground level. And then when they come back in, they're, they're just so much nicer shape-wise. And then you begin that thinning technique from there. A question about hydrangea quercifolia. In attempting mm -hmm. to thin out and also decrease the blocking of the windows, what is mm -hmm. the best time to prune 
so that you have flower growth the next year? And can you inadvertently decrease flower growth if you prune at the wrong time? You can absolutely decrease flower growth by pruning at the wrong time. I will say you may want to go ahead and take that one year off and just say, I know I'm going to lose flowers this year. The reason I say that is even though I might want to save flowers, right now when I can see the stems is the best time to do this well. I can do a lot more damage once the leaves are on because I can't see anything. I got to get in there. I can see everything that I want to fix right now when there are no leaves on. And oak leaf hydrangea leaves are huge. So it really does uh, close the plant up. You might consider sacrificing that one year. But as long as it blooms later than July, I think is kind of the cutoff when it's a summer bloomer, that means it's growing on new wood. So it's going to put on the new wood and then flower. If it flowers before July, that means that the flowers were formed in the fall and we're just waiting for them to open this season. So azaleas are old wood bloomers. It means all of these azaleas have flowers waiting to open. The cherry laurel, there were buds on it when I pruned it. That said, no one pays too much attention to cherry laurel flowers, so it's less important. Boxwoods are flowering now or will in two weeks. Doesn't really matter, I would do it now. So even though you may lose flowers for a season, it depends on how much you need to prune. You might be able to get away with little pruning and keep the flowers, but if it needs to be a big pruning, you might want to go ahead and buy some uh, oak leaf hydrangeas from the farmer's market to enjoy inside for that season just because you really need to get the pruning done. Someone has a boxwood that looks very healthy, but when they look at it from above, there's a hole in the middle. Is there anything to do about that? Not necessarily. Uh, if it's growing back, that's what's important. As long as the plant is growing back, then it's recovering. If the reason that if the reason that hole is there is because there was a disease or some other problem, that's the concern I would have. Often when boxwood have a hole in the top, it's because they're often used as foundation plants and snow slides off the roof and it plunks right in the middle and then that freezes or dies back. So as long as you understand why it died back, you don't necessarily have to do anything. What is standard pruning for the native, not the foreign beauty berry? For the most part, I leave that alone, except to take branches that are in the way. If height is an issue, then you might allow canes from the bottom to grow and then plan to take the big ones. But what I mean by it's just not as vigorous growing as like the American beauty berry. So you're not having to manage the canes every year as you would for another species. You're allowing it to grow. And if it's in the right place, you don't have to do a tremendous amount of pruning. Thanks. You can do light thinning if, again, if branches are crossing and getting in the way or coming into areas. It's not one that I have to prune all the time. It's just managing for keeping airflow and things like that if it's in the right location. When someone has deer damaged branches on a Japanese maple, would pruning the dead stumps be the right thing to do or is there some other strategy? I'm going to assume this is probably a shorter Japanese maple. And yeah, prune it back to either a place where there's another branch or there's a bud. And then as it grows out, it'll look better. It'll outgrow it eventually anyway. But if you wanted to tidy it up, Japanese maples are starting to leaf out now. So it might not be worth it in the short term, but it, it does correct the damage and make a cleaner cut. It just depends on if you're dealing with 500 cuts or 20. Um, obviously, the deer may come back, so you may have to figure out a strategy for that. There was a question about whether you should put diseased limbs in your green recycling mm -hmm. container or if you should not. And if not, what do you do with them? I mean, the official line is that they should be burned. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, we don't necessarily have access to, you know, we don't live on farms where we just make a burn pile. Technically, they're not supposed to go into the compost pile. If it's a municipal compost pile, it may heat up enough that the disease is killed. But homeowners have very few resources. If you put it in your trash and you live in Arlington or Alexandria, it'll go to the incinerator. So that possibility. But anywhere else, it may just go to a landfill. So the official line is burn it, but you may not have a choice. The part I have about pruning trees is short. And the reason it's short is because trees are such long-lived organisms that bad pruning really affects them significantly. So I want people to think a lot about pruning before they get to a tree. 
Ideally, if you've got an issue branch like coming out into a walkway, follow the same techniques we talked about where you are making a good cut to a bud or to another branch that's going away from your walkway. You're trying to focus your cuts on branches that are two to three inches in diameter at most. Take care of those issues while they're small, when they're along a walkway or you need them to go over your head. Something that homeowners do a lot is this thing called limbing up where they go, oh, I'd like the bottom five feet to be clear. Well, limbing up is something that we like the way it looks, but it's not great for the trees. Any branches on a tree along the trunk help strengthen the trunk at that location. So if you can keep the branches on there, keep them. Um, if they're in a walkway and you need to get rid of them because they're poking your kids in the face, shorten them and just keep shortening them, but leave them at that height so that they can provide the energy that the tree needs and strengthen the trunk. If you have somebody coming to prune your trees, gosh, 20 to 25% of the canopy is like a max that I would say. That's even less than our 30%. And if you're dealing with a mature tree that's been at that house for 70 years, don't cut it unless you need to cut something. Don't go for the 20 to 25%. You're only cutting the things that you need. And even more importantly than on shrubs, you're trying to make as few cuts as possible to achieve the goal. I mentioned this two to three inches. That's ideally what I think a tree company should also be doing because those giant two foot wide stumps that you see left on trees where a giant limb was cut off, those will never close and the tree is so old that it probably cannot seal out any pathogens coming in there. So making as few cuts as possible to achieve the goal, the smallest cuts possible, but everywhere you cut is a point where decay can enter. Another thing people do is they take out every single water sprout or sucker. What that always means on a tree is that something is going on. It either means there's an insect pathogen, it means it's buried too high, it means you pruned a branch, a really big branch, and now the tree is trying to recover. So before you cut all of those out, investigate what's going on. There's a reason that those are there. This idea that they'll take over on the tree, not necessarily, but you need to understand why it's going on. And this lovely picture I have here is an example of what you should not do to a tree, whether it's a crepe myrtle or an oak or anything. That's called tree topping. And it's not a technique that is good for trees. I would argue it doesn't even look good really quite bad for trees and I think it's something that's becoming more common because people don't know that it's not okay but it's not for the various reasons we just talked about we've got a lot of cuts and it, it really stresses the trees and in, in, in a case of a really old tree would kill it again the very basic these are the same things we talked about before I'm just putting it into tree pictures instead so you're pruning to a growing point a bud a main branch, sometimes more visible on trees, is this concept of a collar. So that's this little collar. It looks like a collar. So that's something that you're trying to keep, and you don't want to cut into that because that's where the tree is going to be able to seal it up. So if you Google branch collar, you're going to find a lot of information of that. And if you're cutting back to a shorter branch, you want it to be at least a third of the diameter of the larger branch. If the branch that you're cutting back is a three-inch diameter branch, but you want to redirect it to a side branch, that side branch you're cutting back, you should be at least one inch if the main one is three inches. And the three-point cut is if you're dealing with heavy branches. Google three-point cut is a way of reducing the weight on the branch before you make the final knife cut. So you cut here and you cut here. That's this picture here on the right. And that takes off this whole portion of the branch. And then what you're left cutting is just this little, I don't know, this isn't to scale, but let's say you're left with a five-inch piece to cut off rather than a six foot because otherwise it'll rip down the side of the trunk which you see all the time on trees. The branch collars we talked about when you make a good cut on a tree this is a sycamore. Uh, once you make a good cut you should see this kind of wound closing. It's going to take you know this was maybe the one year or less than one year wound wood. This is a very young tree so it's going to be very fast but it'll take probably at least three years to seal that up. There's a large amount of research on a concept called coat it. The compartmentalization of decay in trees, it also applies to shrubs because they're both woody plants. But if you look it up, Dr. Alex Shigo, he's no longer alive, but he was a U.S. Forest Service uh, researcher and arborist that did an extensive amount of research on this. If you want to know about pruning trees and what good tree pruning looks like, the University of Florida, although this is a Virginia Cooperative Extension, resources here are just too excellent not to recommend them. 
and they have videos and a lot of really great explanations broken down. So I would highly recommend that they're directed toward arborists, but they're great resources for homeowners too. For young trees in suburban and urban environments, the, the best kind of pruning is what's called structure pruning. And these are two different examples where really you're doing that same thinning that we talked about. We're doing some thinning, but we're also making sure that the tree maintains one central leader. So this is an example of a tree that was structure pruned where you're keeping branches and spacing them and bringing it to one, one leader instead of multiple. This one had a lot of cicada damage. Um, so I think that's where the multiple leaders came from. But trees in sunlight will just send up multiple leaders. So it might be a harder thing for homeowners. So it might be something to consult an arborist on. But again, the University of Florida has videos on it. So they're great at home to kind of understand what it is you're trying to do. And this is the direction that I would say arboriculture is going, where we're trying to do more tree care work when trees are young, rather than correct cracks and things or broken, you know, half the tree falling off when they're much older. And those things usually mean the death of the tree or it has to be removed. Fruit trees, I get questions about those. Those are totally different altogether because, again, you're talking about objectives that are different. And when you're trying to get fruiting plants, you're trying to do something different for optimal fruit production. So that's something for a different set of questions. I think that's uh, the end on the trees. We're kind of racing to the end, but um, hopefully we got most of your questions and I'm happy to stay online for the other questions that we didn't get to. Okay, you asked for it. They wanted to know how to prune an elderberry. As little as possible. <laughs> um, elderberries, I would put in the same category as viburnum. They're both opposite, and they get really strange looking when they're pruned too much. I would go for the oldest canes or the oldest things all the way to the ground, because any intermediate cuts on an elderberry, yet they just go in every direction, and they're very unruly. And they're suckering plants that come up everywhere. So... If you have them creeping to all the places you don't want them, just cut those other ones to the ground, but it's going to keep suckering. How about wisteria and a pergola? How to prune mm -hmm. that? Hopefully your pergola is strong enough. They can take over. I don't have wisteria, but let me scroll down to something that I have that might. So this was from a previous presentation. So wisteria on a pergola, you want to try to, this is not a pergola, I know that, but you're going to get the most flowering as long as the plant stays horizontal. So really keep pruning to keep it horizontal. If it keeps trying to creep up, pin it down because you'll get better flowering. And the other thing that you want to work for is the wisteria has multiple stems and you want, let's say, the base of your pergola to have more greenery and not just looking at the vine, although the vine is lovely. You're going to have to make some cuts to vines low so that it keeps leafing here. That's what these are. These are leafing here because there are cuts there and there are new shoots there. Otherwise, you're just going to get this vining look all over. So this isn't wisteria, but it's a vine, and it might give you some ideas for that. But if you're trying to get it up, let it grow up the pergola until it gets up there, and then pin it down or, or make it run along horizontal wires on the pergola. What about pruning smoke bush? Smoke bush can be maintained as a shrub, which has a bunch of stems. Or you can maintain it as a tree. I've seen some lovely old smoke bush trees. So it depends. If you want to maintain it like a shrub, then you're going to do the same kind of cane pruning we talked about where you're getting rid of some older stems just to keep it in size for what you want and letting new shoots come from the base. If you're going to encourage one stem, then you're going to encourage the one stem and then just prune off what is affecting the shape that you want. But there are some really lovely old looking smoke bushes too. There's nothing that says you have to keep it as a shrub form. But smoke bush is warled. It's, it's one that puts growth around the whole. So it's not just two, it's like three or four or five. So if you can avoid just cutting to the middle of something, it's worse than viburnum. It's five growing points rather than two. So getting the shape you want and then leaving it and just taking as little as you need is, is the best case if you're trying to get it to a tree form. Someone moved into a house with a large bay magnolia that has eight or ten stems, and it hasn't been trained to have one leader. Should they do something about that? I'm guessing they're saying sweet bay magnolia, which is the native magnolia. Yes. It depends on the size of the stem. At this point, you cannot train it to a single trunk for many reasons. If you want a single trunk one, you should get it as a single trunk. If it has eight trunks, it was probably meant to have multi, multiple trunks. That's how it was trained in the nursery. 
So I wouldn't change it from multi to single. What you might consider is reducing the number of stems because eight is a lot. Once they get really crowded, they begin to push in on each other and it can cause dieback of some of the branches. So if you have small ones that are, say, like, I don't know, three inches, maybe four inches max, you could consider cutting those down if they're not so big. The problem with something that's grown multi-stem for this long is that the branches on the adjacent stem, if it was shaded out by another stem, it means it won't have branches on one side. So you could end up with something that looks very odd because you got rid of some of the stems. So if they're small enough, I would maybe reduce the number of stems. But if the tree's been there for a long time and now the stems are, you know, six inches plus, trees grow for a long time. And in the next 30 years, there may be no issues. So you may just enjoy the tree as it is, but only take them out if they're small enough. Someone asked about a mature non-native dogwood that is growing against the house and they want to keep it alive, but keep their house safe. The, the non-native dogwood that I can think of, I don't think I have a picture here. The non-native dogwood that I can think of that's most common around here is the Fusa dogwood. It has a kind of peely bark. Usually those don't get big enough to be a safety issue. Things like oaks and some of the larger canopy trees are usually the safety issues for risk. But what I would say is to bring it off the house to either bring it all the way to the trunk if the branch is small enough to be cut to the trunk, meaning it's not like a six-inch branch because if you bring it all the way back, it's probably going to create a pretty bad wound on the tree there. But the best case would be to shorten the branch to get it away from the house and I would redirect it, meaning bring the cut back to a branch that's going sideways or away from the house. And that would be, you could start with something like that and see how the tree responds and then go from there. Can holly trees and shrubs be hard pruned, including the yes. leader, and will they regenerate? As an arborist, I'm not supposed to cut back like tops of trees, um, <laughs> like we just showed, but hollies are in between shrub trees that are often pruned that way very hard. I don't have pictures of one that I've done it to recently, but it is something that I've done. My recommendation would be, if you're trying to reduce its size significantly, would be cut it back in the spring, like now, for the first time only, and then let it regrow. You can thin off the sides as well. And then every subsequent year, try to prune it in the summer because hollies keep their size a lot better if you prune them in the summer, uh, meaning like July, June, July. Uh, and finally, Otherwise, they'll just shoot back. How would you prune a gold mop cypress? The gold mop cypresses respond to pruning very well. Depends on what your problem is, but usually you can shorten. You're always trying to go back to a point of live growth. So the way the mop cypresses grow is sort of like umbrellas, but there's an umbrella, then it grows a little bit, then another umbrella grows a bit or maybe goes sideways one way and does one umbrella sideways to a different umbrella, so you have two. What you want to do is make sure you go to one of those umbrella points. Don't just cut to the middle because you're going to mess up the shape. So find a spot where you go to an existing umbrella that's the right size, let's say, if it's in front of a window or if it's in front of something else you're trying to open up. And then the same technique for thinning. So bring down the height using that and then go along the sides and just Take the branches back partway in this case, but to something that's live and still coming over. So it'll open up. It'll look less moppy and a little more open. And that'll encourage some of the new growth without changing the shape. But you can bring mop cypresses down to another level that already exists in the plant. If it's a huge one, maybe start with a third or 25% height reduction. And then if you're really trying to go more, you'll have to see as the years go on if you can take it lower. Okay, well, the questions have stopped and the praise is rolling in. People uh, are commenting on how brilliant and helpful this was, how the graphics are oh awesome, the presentation oh was so good, and we got lots and lots of thank yous. So oh let me good, add good, to good. that and say thank you. This was a really, really uh, information dense and very informative presentation, and we all thank you very oh much. Good.